The next item of business is a debate on motion 17304 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the impact of Brexit on Scotland's food and drink. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and move the motion. For up to 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Um, presiding officer, I'm pleased the Parliament has set time today to discuss the implications for Scotland's food and drink industry of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union and specifically the catastrophic impact that there would be were we to leave without a deal. The reason why this is important is because the food and drink industry will be one of the sectors most adversely affected by Brexit, threatening the economic growth of industry and even worse, undermining its ambition to double its value to £30 billion by the year 2030. Our food and drink industry is both economically and culturally vital to Scotland. It is one of the largest employers. It sustains jobs in some of our most fragile and rural communities. It's underpinned, of course, by our farming and fishing industries, primary producers producing and providing markets for the raw material they harvest, cultivate and catch. And increasingly, it's also becoming the bedrock of our tourism office, offer of why people enjoy marvellous holidays in our beautiful, constantly sunny countryside, as we see today. Uh, and it continues also to be the star on the international stage, with our whiskey and seafood being exported to over 100 markets across the world. The stats speak for themselves. Exports at record levels, 6.3 billion, up 78% since 2007. Sales of Scottish brands across the UK market, 37% since 2007. Investment by Scottish businesses, up 72% since 2007. And the birth rate of new businesses as well, up 86% in the past eight years. And today, presiding officer, I can share the news that the latest turnover statistics measuring the overall value of the industry in monetary terms were published. These show that turnover in Scotland's food and drink sector is now at record levels. Turnover for 2017 was valued at 14.8 billion, an increase of 836 million on the previous year. What a tremendous tribute to all of those who work in the sector, uh, helped by the continued and substantial support from the Scottish Government. Indeed, since the EU referendum result in June 2016 alone, the Scottish Government has provided £90 million pounds worth of grants to the industry through our EMFF and FPMC uh, programmes, supporting over 600 projects the length and breadth of the country. And this support has given businesses the confidence, even in the face of uncertainty, both to invest and grow, grow their ambition, their workforce, their product range, their productivity and their reputation. And it's our reputation in Scotland, founded on provenance, on quality, on heritage, that I believe makes Scotland stand out from the crowd. But success in those markets has been hard earned. It doesn't come easily or overnight. It requires substantial effort to build a customer base and even more effort to maintain it in the face of stiff competition globally. And for some sectors such as seafood, the supply chains are finely honed to ensure maximum speed and efficiency facilitated through trading arrangements which are built up over a number of years. Last month, however, we came perilously close to jeopardizing all of this. As members know, the uh, European Council has extended the UK's membership of the European Union until the 31st of October. This extension rescued us uh, from the nightmare scenario. And had this not happened, presiding officer, the impact in the food and industry would have, uh, food and uh, drink sector would have been <coughs> catastrophic. There would have been severely, severe disruption of our supply chains, imposition of punitive tariffs, loss of markets, complex and costly non-tariff barriers, including the requirement for export health certificates. But thankfully, we were spared that. However, as things stand, if an agreed way forward is not found soon, the risk of a no deal will rise again with the potential of more money, time and effort being wasted. Now, of course, the UK government could remove that risk now by making it clear that if the only alternative is a no deal, 
then it will revoke Article 50 instead. That is in its gift. Until that happens, the Scottish Government will continue to do all it can to support the industry prepare. Over the past six months, we've worked extensively with stakeholders from across the industry to seek to minimize the damage if we crashed out. And today, I want to update members across the chamber on that work. I spoke earlier of the success of the industry, and at the heart of that success, I contend, presiding officer, is our trading relationship with the EU. Because uh, last year, over two thirds of our food exports went to the EU. Seven out of 10 top export markets are in the EU. The EU is the largest market for Scotch whiskey. 64% uh, of seafood exports go to the EU, the, ma the majority relying on just-in-time supply chains across the channel. France alone accounts for a quarter of red meat exports. And also our seafood industry is heavily reliant on EU nationals, many of whom have made a life in Scotland. And indeed in Grampian, over 70% of the workforce are from the EU. Now, the reason the implications are so severe is because the food and drink industry is significantly far more important to Scotland's economy than it is to the rest of the UK's, particularly England. Our food and drink exports are four times more important to our economy than they are to the economy in England. Seafood, ex seafood exports account for 58% of our overall food exports, and this compares to seafood, e seafood exports from England accounting to only 6% of their food exports. The seed potato industry, which exports over 30,000 tonnes annually to the EU, is unique to Scotland. The cumulative impact, therefore, of leaving the EU without a deal is estimated to be a 2,000 million pounds loss of sales for Scotland's industry. Presiding officer, these figures are calculated by the industry using the UK government's own economic projections. I have conveyed this to the UK government. Indeed, I wrote to Mr. Gove on the 19th of February, setting out 10 very clear and practical asks, issues such as guaranteeing continued protection in the EU for our iconic products that hold protected geographical indications, PGIs, absolutely essential to high quality Scottish produce, negotiating market access both to the EU and third country markets, facilitating frictionless supply chains by allocating space on the government-funded ferries for seafood and other time-sensitive products, seeking a derogation from the EU to avoid the need for export health certificates, estimated incidentally to cost the industry up to 15 million pounds per annum extra, financial support for livestock producers, particularly sheep farmers, likely to be completely shut out of export markets because of the impact of tariffs, but despite these and other compelling arguments, which I conveyed in person, Mr. Gove's res response, sadly, was non-committal. Certainly. Edward Mountain. Cabinet Secretary, thank you for taking an intervention. I believe yesterday at the evidence session that Michael Gove the, gave to the REC Committee when asked on the problems facing the sheep industry, he said words to the effect of, I am waiting for the Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing to come to me and we will listen to all his proposals. Have you gone to him with specific proposals and could you lay them out for us so we can understand them? Fergus Ewing. Well, uh, not only have we gone to him to discuss an appropriate compensation scheme, we have had several discussions about this face-to-face -face around the table uh, and that includes a compensation scheme on a headage basis which would provide an element of compensation to hill farmers in Scotland. I'm pleased to say that there is an, an element of apparent agreement, but there is no proposals specifically from the UK government. And indeed, the minutes of the devolved administration UK government meeting, uh, which discussed Brexit costs, will record the fact that Mr. Gove undertook on behalf of the UK government confirmed in the minutes, which were not challenged at the subsequent meeting, which I also attended, that the UK government will meet all the Brexit costs. Mm -hmm. But then, presiding officer, when we came to discuss, Ms. Goujon was there with me at the time, when we came to discuss how and who would pay for the compensation scheme for our sheep sector, absolutely essential, the paper 
submitted by the UK government said, and wait for it, each devolved administration must pay its own costs. Yes. So I'm glad that I'm able, and thank you for the opportunity, incidentally, Mr. Mountain, to set that on the record. You know, I don't, well, obviously I don't wish to make any comment which could be construed as partisan or party political presiding officer. But I do feel that when I'm challenged there, I should respond to set the record straight. And I'm delighted to have been given that uh, opportunity from Mr. Mountain. So, meantime, uh, whilst we receive warm words, but no action from the UK government, we will continue to work and support the industry through our Food Sector Resilience Group, which we convened back in December. Represented on the group are organizations from across the industry and wider supply chain, including retailers, grocers, wholesalers, haulers, and the public sector. We've undertaken a range of work to minimize the impact. This is very important because this is hard, hard work carried out thousands of hours by civil servants that could have been spent on many, many other things to take our rural economy forward, diverted because of a no deal and the need to deal with it and prepare for the worst whilst hoping for the best. So it included developing sector plans to identify and pursue a range of actions for each sector, working with industry to develop a tailor, tailored risk-based approach to meet EU requirements for export health certificates, scoping out options for alternative supply chains, including the feasibility of air freight, undertaking a detailed assessment of infrastructure around export capability, identifying alternative market opportunities in international markets using our excellent network of 14 in-market specialists, extensive engagement with retailers to scope out potential for increasing their Scottish sourcing in the event of disruption of export markets, development of a new online advisory service, prepare for Brexit, uh, and many other things. And I have sought to give a lead on all of these matters and I've done much of this work with uh, uh, hardworking officials myself and will continue to do so, including uh, on Monday next week. But despite all of these efforts, we know that many businesses were not as prepared as they might be. So I'll, I'll come to a conclusion. I think taking the intervention did take up some of my time. Uh, so I'll just conclude briefly by saying that our, way, our view is the best way to break the deadlock is for the UK to put the issue back to the people with an option to remain in the EU. I believe Mr. Rumbles may expand on that theme further. And we are shoulder to shoulder with Mr. Rumbles and his colleagues on that matter. So in the interim, presiding officer, we're doing much in Scotland to support this exciting sector. We're doing the day job. The future is positive. The figures show it. If we don't jeopardize this because of the political agenda of uh, the London government, uh, then the food and drink sector will continue to thrive and prosper as it richly deserves. I commend the motion. Point of order, Edward Mountain. In my haste to try and get the Cabinet Secretary to correct a statement he made, which he was unable to do, I failed to declare that I have an interest in a farming partnership before I spoke. I know members are aware of that, but I just wanted to put it on the record presiding officers so that I have not misled anyone. It is on the record, Mr Mountain. I now call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move Amendment 17304.1 for up to seven minutes, please. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I move the amendment in my name and also refer to my register of interest in farming and fish farming in there and also the fact that I'm a non-executive director of Murray Income Trust, which is a publicly listed company with food and drink investments. I welcome the opportunity to talk about Scotland's food and drink industry, uh, and I want to pay tribute to the sector. It is one of the bastions of the Scottish economy, uh, and it is, of course, highly significant. Um, and in that sense, I agree with the Cabinet Secretary uh, in terms of the, the warm words he spoke in support of that sector and the people that work within it. As the Highlands and Islands MSP, I know only too well the importance and value of the products that we produce, both locally and nationally, and the important jobs that come from the industry that support many people in the region and beyond. Food and drink is Scotland's largest international export industry, with the manufacture of food and beverages accounting for exports worth £6 billion, pounds, or thereabouts, according to the latest figures. The industry's overall value is, as we know, worth around £15 billion, pounds, and we have long supported the Scottish Government's ambition to double that to £30 billion by 2030. That is proper right and achievable. 
But unlike the SNP, we see Brexit as an opportunity to aid that ambition. Now, undoubtedly, the Brexit process is proving to be challenging, but we want to see a deal pass which respects the referendum result and allows us to trade with other countries, boosting our own goods in the process while maintaining trade and positive cooperation with our friends in the EU. And the existing withdrawal agreement would allow us to do this. And it is clear from the wide support it commands from across Scottish industry that this is the most preferable outcome, which respects the votes, an outcome which would allow us to grow our burgeoning food and drink sector. Let me remind the Cabinet Secretary what that sector said of the deal. The Scotch Whisk Association, who talk on behalf of an industry with an export value worth 4.7 billion to Scotland, said, and I quote, on balance, the draft withdrawal agreement and accompanying political declaration stand up well against the Scotch whisky industry's Brexit priorities. The NFUS said of the deal <clears throat> that while not perfect, it will ensure that there are no hard barriers on the day we leave the EU and will allow trade and agricultural goods in UK food and drink to continue throughout the transition period, largely as before this opportunity needs to be taken. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary thinks they're wrong. Now, of course, we agree that a no-deal Brexit should be avoided, and we agree with the industry that it does present a risk. But we are not proponents of that outcome. We want a deal. We support the deal on the table, the only deal the EU has said is on the table. And the reality is that it is other parties, like the SNP, who have wanted Brexit to fail from day one and are risking no deal <laughs> becoming a reality. I don't have time, I'm afraid. Because what really grates with these benches is that one of the greatest threats to the growth of food and drink is, of course, the SNP's recent announcements relating to a second independence referendum. That is the reality. Independence threatens the UK single market, which accounts for around 60% of Scottish exports. Not only that, but the UK market is three times more important to Scotland than the EU market. And the SNP's plans for an independent Scotland to quickly ditch the pound in favour of a new Scottish currency would put our food and drink businesses at significant economic risk. We are shortly going to waste valuable parliamentary time on legislation for such a referendum that just one in five Scots want to see in the next two years. Time which could be spent debating food and drink policy. Time which could be spent debating a good food nation bill. Time which could be spent debating a Scottish agriculture bill. So it ill befits the SNP to come here and preach about the dangers of Brexit when the policy of independence would wreak havoc on Scotland's food and drink sector. Yes. Alistair Allen. I, I thank the member for giving way and listen to what he has to say about what he feels is the agenda of this parliament uh, being overtaken by constitutional matters. Is he aware just how little time the United Kingdom parliament has been able to devote to any subject other than Brexit in the last few months? Yeah, zero. Donald well, of course, of course, of course, Mr. Allen would prefer to divert attention from the lack of ambition that his party, his government, show in this parliament. Because that, uh, that lack of ambition is clear today. A pattern has emerged when it comes to a Brexit debate. It is, a fa it, it, it is simply a smokescreen to hide the failure of his government to come up with anything novel or radical when it comes to policy. And the NFUS Director of Policy said recently of the Scottish government's agriculture approach there is no vision. He said, we, we have not got a clue at the moment. That's a pretty damning indictment, in my view, presiding officer. Because if we are to succeed in delivering an even more successful food and drink industry, we need to drive policy from the point of view of farm to fork, ensuring that each stage of the process is properly supported, where appropriate, by government and tailored to specific needs. That is part of the, I, I'm afraid, I think I'm in, I, um, yes, yeah, so I'll take the intervention, sorry. I wasn't sure how many minutes I had, presiding. Not many. Alec Rowley. <laughs> Mr Cameron, given way, you can have one of my minutes. Can I, can I say that last year, last summer, the fruit farmers in particular, but the farm and industry found it very, very difficult to be able to recruit workers. Uh, given, given the botched visa scheme that, that, that has been proposed from the government in Westminster, what needs to happen in order to ensure workers are there this year and we don't have fruit rotten in the fields. I can give you up to eight minutes, Mr Cameron. I'm, I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding, on, on, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I mean, my answer to that is that I hope that the UK and Scottish governments can work together on a system which um, will help seasonal workers, and there is, of course, a pilot at the moment, uh, and that there is a step 
towards that, and I hope that succeeds, and we obviously hope that it expands. If we are uh, to succeed um, in delivering a more successful food and drink industry, we have a great opportunity. We have an opportunity to grow that sector and tailor policy to benefit Scottish producers and Scottish businesses. We and others across this chamber are still waiting for a good food nation bill. And we're very sympathetic with both the Labour amendment and the Green amendments in terms of what they say in this regard. WWF Scotland has said that such a bill would help Scotland navigate this period of change and tackle the multiple environmental, social and economic challenges of the Scottish food system and harness the opportunities. And on that very subject of our excellent, unique produce, it's important to recognise the work that is going on to protect some of our most iconic brands. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation in March said that leaving the common fisheries policy will enable us to elevate the UK onto the world stage as a sustainable seafood harvesting and marketing nation. These are all important steps to give many people involved in our food and drink sector confidence going forward. And Deputy Presiding Officer, there are many opportunities for our food and drink sector going forward. And the Scottish Conservatives believe that if we get Brexit right, this can be a critical part of plans to grow the sector. But we are deeply concerned that this could be a missed opportunity if the SNP government continue in their attempts to prevent a Brexit deal. We believe in our food and drink sector and we know that it can thrive even more with the right support and if we grasp the opportunities ahead. Thank you. I call on Rhoda Grant to speak to and move amendment 17304.2 for six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I, like others, want to highlight the economic benefit of the food and drink industry to Scotland. And there's no doubt that Brexit looms large over the industry. An old deal Brexit would be a disaster and the pro that prospect is causing uncertainty and concern. Import tariffs would lead to higher prices in the supermarkets and shops and delays at the border. Depending on the level of tariffs, it could lead to a shortage of certain kinds of food, and as the Cabinet Secretary said, putting exports at even greater risk. We must do everything we can to ensure we don't have a no-deal Brexit. I would ask the Scottish Government that it does everything in its power to ensure that that does not happen. They need to set aside their constitutional wrangles, stop using Brexit as a lever for independence and work for the best interests of the Scottish people. I read in the papers recently that Indiref 2 was the First Minister's top priority. How sad when engulfed by the chaos of leaving a political and econo economic union that she simply looks to adding to that chaos by leaving another. If Brexit is bad, independence would be four times worse. We already see with devolved tax and benefits the difficulty the Scottish Government have in putting pl in place the system that could deliver that. These powers are being handed back to Westminster. How much more difficult to unravel the whole of the United Kingdom? On that, yes, sir. Annabel Ewing. I'm most grateful. Um, I had thought that the title of today's debate was the impact of Brexit on Scotland's food and drink, and I would have thought that the member would be able to seek to support the many, many important businesses in her constituency who would be crying out for their voice to be heard who work in the sector on this important uh, debate. Rhoda Grant. And, indeed, and, and stopping the breakup of the United Kingdom actually assists the food and drink producers in my constituency. I, Excuse me, Ms Grant. I won't have shouting between benches, please. It's not acceptable. Rhoda Grant. I simply ask that the Scottish Government use their devolved powers in order to put us in a better place and come what may. Firstly, it's simply wrong that in a rich country we have people who are going hungry. Children suffer from diseases and malnutrition that our parents' generation thought they would never see again. The Scottish Government have power to legislate for a right to food. It's a human right. It's a human right, so let us legislate to enshrine it in our laws. This will enable us to ensure that no one goes hungry and enable us to hold ourselves and the Scottish Government accountable when they do. The scourge of malnutrition and obesity could be dealt with, and with that, the unnecessary chronic health problems and pressures that it will store up for the NHS in the future. We also need to face up to climate change. 
It's a climate emergency, and I think we're agreed on that. We hear that agriculture is the biggest contributor to climate change. However, we seldom hear about what they sequestrate. There's no credit for the forestry our farmers and crofters plant, or indeed the grasslands they manage. Both these activities sequestrate carbon. We hear they should get rid of livestock, sheep and cows. However, no cognizance is taken that these animals protect the very grasslands that sequestrate more carbon than forestry. Livestock also protect biodiversity and it's already suffering because of the lack of stock in the, hill, in the hills. The Scottish Government must, as a matter of urgency, draw up a new subsidy scheme that helps farmers and crofters work to sequestrate more carbon and greenhouse gases. And we simply cannot go on with the schemes that we have if we're going to meet the targets that they have set. Soil management is not only good for the environment, but it's also good for production, a win-win to help climate and make farms more productive. But it too can be expensive for crofters and farmers to do. So we need a scheme that recognises that and helps them with those costs. It'll be too late to meet the interim targets if we delay devising the new scheme until post-2021. While there is uncertainty surrounding Brexit, we cannot simply sign up to climate change targets, declare a climate emergency, and then simply do nothing to deal with that. Our farmers and crofters are seeking leadership from the Scottish Government. They need a measure that takes account of greenhouse gases that they produce, but also a measure that counts what they sequestrate so that they can move to net zero. We need subsidy payments that reflect that along with the other public goods that agriculture provides, public money for public goods. We need to set a direction of travel that gives producers a clear indication of what they can expect help for in the future and what they cannot. So while we need to seek reassurance about a no-deal Brexit, and yes, staying in the EU is the best way to support the status quo. However, we have had a referendum and we need to try and honour the democratic will of the people. That said, I don't really believe that people voted for the chaos we now face. Therefore, we need to find the best outcome possible. Governments cannot alone overturn the will of the people. If they seek to do that, they need to go back to the people to give them the final say. However, we need to consider that a majority vote may still vote to leave. So we need a reasonable deal in place to prevent further crisis before we take that step. My reasons for campaigning for Remain are exactly the same as they are for campaigning to stay in the United Kingdom. Our food and drink sector, as well as the country as a whole, are better served as part of a larger alliance which allows trade and assistance to flow, be that the EU or the UK. A good food nation, taking account of environmental issues, farm to fork agricultural support, health, hunger and a comprehensive subsidy scheme that would not only give reassurance to the food and drink industry in a time of upheaval, but also set a direction of travel that we want for the country. I think that's where the direction we must go and I move the amendment in my name. I call on Mark Ruskell to speak to and move amendment 17304.3. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can also welcome the opportunity to debate today the impact Brexit will have and in many cases is already having on our food and drink sector. In leaving the EU, we stand to lose economic benefits, but also much, much more. For two generations now, Scotland's food system has been defined by European regulations, policy levers, and funding streams underpinned by the common agricultural policy. Now, Greens have long been critical of the cap, but hard-won reforms over the last two decades have at least succeeded in ensuring every country in Europe directly supports agri-environment measures, which have led to the production of much greener food. The strong European consensus is that the future of our food system and the future of our environment are inextricably linked. And I doubt we would have achieved this unanimity without the driving force of the European Union. Greens, of course, would argue that this needs to go further and that climate change and environmental protection should be at the very heart of our farm support system rather than stuck on the fringes. And whilst the UK has been embroiled in the never-ending Brexit row, the rest of the EU has been considering just that. The current round of the cap finishes next year and from 2021 we'll have a new revised system. Now, Scottish MEPs should be around that table, negotiating a united European approach to addressing the climate crisis and providing a strong future for farming communities. But instead, 
They've been disempowered by UK government and sidelined from the process. Greens from across Europe, however, have been participating, bringing together 10 priorities for the future of the CAP, which include harmonizing agricultural policy with health, environment, and climate change targets, fairer distribution of CAP subsidies to support our small and medium-sized farmers, a refocusing on extensive rather than intensive food production, and a comprehensive public goods audit for all public funding and investment. Now, the majority of parties in this chamber have said that they want to remain in the EU. And this means that we should be having parallel discussions right now about what a cap for the climate emergency should look like, whether we end up being part of it or not. Because as my amendment makes clear, if we act now, we can turn a crisis into an opportunity for Scotland's food and drink sector. Public attitudes towards the food they buy, cook and eat have shifted radically in the last few decades with an increasing understanding of the environmental impact of our diets. The number of vegans, for example, in the UK has quadrupled since 2014, with concern for the environment and health, top reasons people give for changing their diet. And many more people are looking to make more gradual changes, with 35% of British consumers reporting having meat-free days throughout the week. Now, the recent UK Climate Change Committee report worked on the assumption that we would see a 20% reduction in meat and dairy consumption in the coming years. And whilst giving evidence to the Eclair Committee on Tuesday, the committee admitted that this was a very conservative estimate based on the consumer patterns that we currently see. So there is no need for a big push for behavior change to achieve this 20% because people are already making that change at the moment. The report, however, said that a 50% reduction in meat and dairy consumption would make a net zero target more achievable. And even this would still see people eating more meat and dairy than is recommended by public health guidelines. If we're all to eat according to the model recommended by Public Health England, we would see a total reduction of meat and dairy consumption by more than 80%. But my point today is that we should not look to fight against these recommendations and the growing consumer trends that they reflect, nor should we see them as a threat to our food and farming sector. We need to embrace the opportunities. Scotland's climate and land means that we can produce carbon-neutral meat and dairy. And there is clearly an appetite for highly sustainable, ethical food. Imagine the opportunities both at home and globally if we, were, if we were able to say eventually that all Scotch lamb and beef was carbon-neutral. But this will require significant change and investment, mainstreaming techniques like holistic pasture management to lock up more carbon in our soils, incorporating more trees on our farms, and not just as patchy windbreaks, but as integrated silvo pastoral, pastoral systems. And like it or not, it will mean reducing herd densities and switching to more extensive farming. The reward, though, is a premium price for a desirable, sustainable project, product and more land and resources to invest in growing climate-friendly, plant-based foods. Other countries have recognized this already. Ireland's Origin Green is a successful scheme that highlights the most environmentally sustainable food their country has to offer and accounts for 90% now of their food and drink exports. So I do believe that it's time for Scotland to adopt a similar approach. I hope that our future lies firmly in the EU, but whether we stay or not, it will be the climate crisis and our ability to respond to it which will determine whether Scotland's food and drink sector thrives or just survives in the years ahead. Presiding officer, the final part of my amendment today is a reminder to the Scottish Government that's already been given by Donald Cameron and uh, Rhoda Grant of what the Chamber agreed last September. Now, we all know that the Cabinet Secretary inherited his role as champion of the Good Food Nation Bill, but all opposition parties here recognize the desperate need for a joined up food policy, one which brings together multiple strands from health to land use to social policy. And Parliament expects primary legislation this year. So government really must deliver soon. I move the amendment in my name. I now call Mike Rumbles. Six minutes, please, Mr Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Food and drink is at the very heart of our culture and traditions in Scotland. Generations of farmers and thousands of European Union workers have contributed to our world-class food and drink sector, particularly in my own region of the North East, building it into the genuine success story that it is today. As we've heard, food and drink is vital to our rural economy, bringing much needed employment and business opportunities to families and communities all over rural Scotland. 
However, our producers are on the front line of the greatest threat to our economy for very many years. And I do not say that lightly. We've just heard from the Cabinet Secretary that Brexit could cost our farming, fishing and crofting sector some £2 billion a year. And I astonished that the Conservatives don't think that is a major threat. There is no doubt that a no-deal Brexit would be catastrophic for our rural economy. And having questioned Michael Gove on this just yesterday, it is quite obvious to me that he is inexplicably relaxed about a no-deal Brexit. The man in charge of agriculture south of the border refused to confirm to me that he would do everything in his power in the UK cabinet to argue to avoid at all costs a no-deal Brexit. Quite frankly, it is astonishing to me that the Conservatives have failed to rule out a no-deal Brexit. We will be supporting the Scottish Government's motion today. I'm very pleased to say that we support it absolutely. As far as the amendments are concerned, I want to say that the Liberal Democrats prefer the Government's motion as it stands. It properly reflects our position. We are the only party in this chamber that wants to stay in both our unions. Make no bones about that, both our unions. And therefore, we will not be supporting any of the amendments as all of them, in our view, dilute the message we want to set out from our Parliament. By far the largest market for our food and drink remains the rest of the UK. 61% of all Scottish exports are destined for the rest of the UK. Cheap, low quality, low quality imports from countries outside the European Union would undermine all the good work that our producers have done, not to mention endangering our progress towards green and sustainable land use. For that reason, our food and drink industry's reputation for quality must be protected. Scotland's food exports are sold across the European Union, and the removal of the common European Union framework could seriously impact on our trade. On top of that, and the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary already mentioned it, non-tariff barriers with the EU could cause administrative delays that would be particularly detrimental to our trade in fresh produce. In addition, we are now seeing how important non-UK nationals are for agriculture and our wider food and drink industry. And it annoys me intensely how the UK government is just ignoring that. Whilst the UK government has allowed 2,500 visas for migrant workers, the National Farmers Union of Scotland has reported that the number of vacancies left open this year will be a staggering 10,000 across the UK as a whole. What will happen to our fruit growers if those jobs can't be filled? The answer is simple. Thousands of tons of food rotting in the fields because of the lack of workers. And this is a deliberate policy of the Conservative UK government. Currently, one third of the current labour force across Scotland's food and drink sector comes from the EU countries. I fail to see how those numbers can be replaced without free movement across the continent. And I know uh, many of, my, uh, of the colleagues that sit on the Rural Economy Committee believe that it's important to have free movement across the continent, but they seem to be silent in this debate. A no-deal Brexit would write off some of our best producers and damage many rural communities. Until now, the Scottish food and drink industry has been going from strength to strength, assisted by the government, and so we have a duty to support it. There is, of course, more the Scottish government could do to mitigate the damage of Brexit on our rural economy, and I've said many times in this chamber that I want to see a bespoke system of support for Scotland with continued financial support for the foreseeable future. And I know the Cabinet Secretary is making progress on this. But as long as Brexit and the threat of a no deal remains on the table, the UK government and Conservative MSPs in this chamber who support it have a great deal of responsibility and a great deal to answer for the damage that will be thrust upon our rural economy. However, I want to end on a, a positive note from our perspective. The Liberal Democrats believe that the continued success, and it is a huge success, of a food and drink industry, as the motion before us says today, can best be achieved through continued membership of the European Union. Thank you.
We move on to the open debate. Speeches of five minutes, please. Bruce Crawford, followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, it's now nearly seven weeks from the date that the UK was originally expected to leave the European Union. And many of us in this place simply cannot believe that we were cl close to the precipice of economic catastrophe as we became. That being said, even to this very day, the UK government will not categorically rule out leaving the EU without a deal. Despite the fact that even their own analysis says that such a scenario would severely hit the Scottish economy. And as we see in the media reports, the Tories are intent in putting this country through the ringer of despair yet again by attempting to resurrect May's deal from the dead. They have learned nothing from the months and months of purgatory that they've put our citizens through and they're holding them in as well as our businesses. It's clear that Westminster is incapable of finding a resolution. So I agree with the Minister. It's time for the Cabinet Secretary. It's time to let the people decide. But before I get tempted into too much of the European election mode, I'll better move on, President Officer. President Officer, excluding oil and gas, in 2017, we exported 14 point million pounds of goods to the EU, a 13.3 increase on the previous year. The EU remains our fastest growing trading sector. Now, of course, our biggest export success is the food and drink sector. And as recently as in March this year, we learned that the Scotland's overseas food and drink exports had increased by 293 million in 2018, up 4.9% to an impressive record high, a record high of 6.3 billion pounds. The EU remains the destination as the Cabinet Secretary said, for two thirds of our food exports. And despite these impressive figures, I'm pleased the Scottish Government have shown their determined to grow our export business even more, with an ambitious growth plan, which aims to increase the value of exports from 20% to 25% of Scotland's GDP over the next 10 years. A trading nation, a plan for growing Scotland's exports, sets out how Scotland can add around 3.5 billion to GDP and create 17,500 jobs. In the face of the EU un exit uncertainty, the trading nation gives us clear signal of Scotland's ambition to remain an open, progressive nation where our businesses can trade in global markets, particularly in food and drink, and there is support, extra support in this plan for the food and drink sector. But should make no mistake, this growth, this trade, this aspiration will be undermined by the threat of leaving the EU, European Union. Those who support crashing out of the EU without a deal tell us they want the UK to trade with the rest of the world as if the, this will happen by some sort of magic wand. However, there's one very, very good reason why we have built a single market with our closest international neighbours. That is because they are our closest inter national neighbours. And having a single market with your neighbours is just makes it so much easier and much more sense for products such, fresh products such as Scotch lamb and beef or Scottish salmon. And it's clear that any tariffs applied to these products for sale in the EU would have a devastating impact for the Scottish farmers, including those in my constituency. Moreover, the UK government's planned abandonment of the freedom of movement of people presents a real and present risk to our food and drink sector. EU immigrants make up an incredible contribution to the sector, all the way through from the farm gate, to processing, to marketing, to retail, indeed right through to the hospitality businesses. Scotland's economy needs that constant stream of inward migration from our neighbouring countries, but this is being threatened by the UK Tory government. Another important area that I briefly want to touch on, President Officer, is protected geographical indicators through the European Union. And I want to put my record, on record my gratitude to my colleague Emma Harper, who's raised this issue time and time again in this place. PGIs are the best way to ensure that products local to specific locations in Europe do not suffer from competition from cheap copycats, as suggested by Mike Rus Rumbles, or much lower and quality and non-existent provenance. 
This status ensures the integrity of Scottish products bought and sold across the entire European single market and throughout the countries that have trade deals with the EU. Of course, the only real way to protect EU protected status for Scottish products is to remain in the European Union. And, President Officer, if I could be so bold, the best way of ensuring that we remain in the EU is to vote for the SNP in next week's European elections. Peter Chapman, followed by Annabel Ewing. I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I register an interest as a partner in the farming business. In the Brexit referendum, I voted to remain. Nevertheless, as soon as I heard the result, I was committed to make it happen. Unfortunately, we all underestimated how difficult it would be, and as of now, we have obviously not left, and we don't know what deal will gain parliamentary support. I want to leave. I want to leave with the only deal on the table, as do the NFUS, the Scotch Whisky Association, and virtually the whole business community. But uncertainty abounds. Most of us agree we do not want a no-deal Brexit. So let me be clear. The only sure way to avoid a no-deal Brexit is to vote for the deal on the table. Our food and drink industry is a vital part of our economy. Since 2007, we have seen the industry grow 44% to £14 billion. Pounds. Our exports are, worth, are up 56%, worth £5.5 billion, and food and drink has grown at twice the rate of the rest of the manufacturing economy. This is a great success story for Scotland. And to be honest, it's no surprise that our food and drink has grown at this rate, as we have such a diverse natural environment and some of the best farmers, business people and fishermen in the world. Scotch whisky is around, I will. Mike Rumbles. Considering that we heard that 70% uh, of our workforce in the food and industry, drinking industry is from the EU, does the member think that it's, does he believe that it's, it's worth keeping free movement of people to help our food and drink industry? Peter Chapman. We don't need free movement, but we do need to allow the, 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 the people in that we need to, to grow our economy. <laughs> and that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what we will achieve. That's exactly what we will achieve. That is exactly what we will achieve. The, where are we? Scotch whisky is around 80% of our food and drink. It is not just Scotland's, but the UK's largest net contributor to our balance of trade. This is a premium product that is sought worldwide and is growing in value and volume year on year. Presiding officer, the SNP obsession with independence means they would like us all to forget they would like us all to forget that our biggest and best export for food and drink is the rest of the UK. For example, 80% of Scotch beef is sold into England. More important to Scotland, it's, the UK single market is over three times more important to Scotland than the EU single market. Scottish exports to the UK are worth £48.9 billion against £14.9 in exports to the whole of the EU. I have no time. But of course, these EU exports are important. And if we vote for the deal on the table, which aims for frictionless and tariff-free trade, there is no reason why we can't keep all these exports and indeed grow them. We must also recognize that there are markets right across the world for our produce. America takes large amounts of our sal salmon, and the Far East is now a premium market for much of our shellfish, to name just two markets. Yeah. And we should be debating making more of that happen rather than debating going back on a democratic yeah, yeah, yeah. vote. With the food and drink sector aiming to grow to be worth 30 billion by 2030, we must continue to support our farmers, fishermen and salmon producers who produce the high quality food and the raw materials on which our world renowned goods are based. And I have said time and time again in this chamber that Brexit offers a prize to design a system of support that suits our farmers and our environment here in Scotland. But this government has made precious little attempt to seize that opportunity. Future support must also focus on our already strong animal welfare and environmental standards. And we must never undermine these high standards by allowing imports 
produced under systems which are illegal here. Presiding officer, today's motion by the Scottish Government makes it abundantly clear that they do not respect the views of Scotland's fishermen. Continued membership of the EU would be a disaster for taking back control of our waters. But this debate today has shown that taking back control is not a priority for this government. They want to maintain the status quo, stay in the EU and stay in the hated CFP. Mm -hmm. Try telling that to our fishermen in the northeast and see how that message goes down. Fishing matters to the Conservatives. We are the only party who recognise and are fighting to obtain the sea of opportunity that Brexit brings, and our fishermen know it. Presiding officer in finishing, I know that many people here today have been left disappointed by the SNP's delayed and discredited promise to deliver the Good Food Nation Bill. They could have used this slot today to bring that to the Chamber and not used another parliamentary debate to scaremonger about Brexit. It is clear they only want one thing, and pushing for a chaotic Brexit is just another tool they are cynically using well to achieve it. Well said. Annabelle Ewing, uh, followed by Colin Smith. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have been called to speak in the debate this afternoon, and at the outset, I would wish to highlight the important role of the sector in my constituency of Cowden Beath, indeed Maui, who members may know uh, uh, in terms of its former name of Marine Harvest, has a salmon processing plant in Recife and employs 636 full-time equivalent workers. It accounts for around 11,200 tonnes of products sold and 165 million in sales. Uh, and as uh, far as the Scottish salmon industry as a whole is concerned, the turnover is just over 1 billion and the gross value added is 365 million. International exports are worth in excess of £600 million and the EU remains the largest single regional market with exports increasing year on year, up 22% from quarter one 2018 to quarter one 2019. It is clear, therefore, that the Scottish salmon sector is a hugely important industry and hugely important to the Scottish economy. It is a premium product. It is an award-winning product and the industry in the sector has seen tremendous growth. However, the continuing Brexit uncertainty is casting a considerable shadow. Indeed, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation has said, and I quote, the Scottish salmon sector believe a no-deal Brexit would be the worst outcome. The Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation has also said, and I quote, a no-deal Brexit would put barriers in the way of our biggest single export market jurisdiction and would present major new problems in getting our fish to European market. They have identified key problems in this regard, including non-tariff barriers. At present, export health certificates are not currently needed for exports to the EU, but in a no-deal Brexit, the possibility of there being uh, requirements for anything up to 200,000 certificates per year looms very large. And where would we rustle up all the extra environmental health officers and vets that would be required? And what would be the cost? We've heard that the costs have been estimated uh, at up to £15 million per annum extra. And how would all this impact on the need to get the product to market in a timely fashion? And then we go on to transportation issues, another key concern for the salmon industry. For with the prospect of total gridlock in the southeast of England, it should be noted that a delay of even just a few hours will make it impossible for fish to get from Scotland to France with one driver, given uh, restrictions on driver hours. And a delay, presiding officer, of more than 12 hours will make it difficult to reassure customers that they will still be getting the fish fresh, a key consideration for the buyer. And whilst the French seafood hub of Boulogne-sur-Mer has put arrangements in place to fast-track fish once cleared, it is the threat of the lengthy queues in South East England that poses the real threat here. To date, the approach of the UK government has been extremely unhelpful, having uh, object, uh, rejected the possibility of special lanes for hauliers of perishable goods. And the UK government has also failed to provide any clarity as to whether new driving license and licenses and permits will be needed and how many will be available. This situation is untenable, it is unacceptable, and no deal must be taken off the table. This was called for in an open letter uh, from the chief execs of various organisations, including Scotland Food and Drink, NFUS, Quality Meat Scotland, Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation and others. 
and I quote uh, from that letter, there is no tolerance for no deal as an option. It must be rejected now. At the same time, the UK government must alter its anti-EU immigration policy uh, uh, plans. If adopted, these plans would be extremely detrimental to not just the Scottish salmon industry, which relies on EU nationals, but also to the entire Scotland food and drink sector. Why does the government not listen to the NFUS who have stated, and I quote, NFUS is very concerned by the obstructive position being taken by the UK government in regard to the future immigration system after breakfast. Or listen to the Director General of the CBI who said just this week that the UK's immigration plans do not work for Scotland and she called for flexibility. And what does this anti-EU national uh, rhetoric say to those EU nationals uh, from the EU27 who are currently employed in Maui in my constituency? What certainty can they have? What about their families? What about their plans to school their children and to see their wider families over the years? Why is the UK government disrespecting these workers so? Presiding officer, a no deal Brexit is bad news uh, for Scotland. A hard Brexit is bad news for Scotland. Indeed, any Brexit is bad news for Scotland. So Scotland did not vote to come out. Scotland voted 62% to remain in the EU. Scotland wants to be in the single market and customs union. Scotland is for Europe. And in closing, I would echo uh, my colleague Bruce Crawford in calling on the people of Scotland to send that message loud and clear by voting SNP next Thursday at the ballot box. Thank you, presiding officer. Colin Smith, followed by Stuart Stevens. Thank you, President Officer. I was under the impression we're not allowed to advocate people voting, but if it's part of the debate today, I'll urge people to vote Labour on Thursday. Now, as we've heard in this debate, the food and drink sector is vital to the economy and to the people of Scotland. It accounts for a, a fifth of our manufacturing turnover, some £14.8 billion pounds a year, with exports alone worth over £6 billion. The nearly 19,000 food and drink businesses employ more than 115,000 people directly and many more jobs through the supply chain, often in some of our most fragile rural economies. In my own home region of Dumfries and Galloway, the sector is worth £1.2 billion pounds to the economy, employing more than 9,000 people. As a local councillor, I had the privilege of launching the Dumfries and Galloway Food Trail, which invites people to eat and drink their way around the natural ladder of the region to discover the artisan food and drink produced by some of the most passionate people in the business. Companies such as the Cream of Galloway near the, the food town of Castle Douglas, where David and Wilma Finley are delivering an ethical farming model that shows there is an alternative to the export of live calves and along the way are producing some of the most amazing ice cream and cheese. Another such business is Lockather, which, Lockather, which I had the privilege as a chair of Dumfries and Galloway Fair Trade Steering Group of awarding Fair Trade flagship employer status, which helped to deliver fair trade status to the region. The trail takes people behind the scenes at food and drink producers such as Annandale Distillery, which after three years is producing its first whisky, a product I can personally vouch for. And the region boasts some of the, the busiest farmer markets, including at Dumfries Railway Station. We have some of the, the best food festivals and celebrations in the country, such as the Stranraer Oyster Festival, which celebrates the area's culture and heritage, and of course, Loch Ryan's world-class oysters. As a result of the importance and potential of the sector, the local Labour-led council have just published a new regional food and drink strategy which aims to double the value of the region's industry mm. to 2.5 billion by 2030. But, President Officer, as is the case across Scotland, this ambition is under threat as a result of Brexit, in particular a no-deal <coughs> Brexit. 96% of businesses in Dumfries and Galloway are small or micro-businesses, meaning the impact of Brexit could put their very existence at risk. With everything from trading terms and tariffs to labour supply now uncertain, it's hard to overstate how damaging Brexit could be to the sector. Increased congestion at ports such as Cairn Ryan poses a serious threat to Scottish food exports, particularly for perishable products such as seafood, which rely on just-in-time delivery. An end to the freedom of movement without a proper adequate replacement will weaken the workforce across the supply chain and leaving the common agricultural policy and common fisheries policy without any idea at all from government what will replace it leaves those at the heart of our world-class food and drink sector in a state of uncertainty. One of the key challenges for the Scottish food and sector industry is the potential loss of geographical indication status, which provides legal protection against imitation and is estimated to more than double the value of its products. 
from products such as Ayrshire Dunlop to Tebetdale cheese, many of our food and drink products benefit from that protected name status. It's particularly important to Scotch whisky, which is by far our biggest export. The industry is worth more than £4 billion a year and accounts for almost three quarters of our exports. Retaining geographical indication status is therefore vital to Scotch whisky. But the protected status of our products are under threat from Brexit and the consequential trade deals that may be negotiated in the future. The importance of food and drink, however, President Officer, goes beyond just its economic importance. Its impact it impacts on everything from health to the environment to the fight against poverty, both here and beyond our shores. In a nation that provides so much outstanding food and drink, it is to a shame that so many children in Scotland still go to bed hungry at night as a result of child poverty levels on the rise. Although our food and drink sector in Scotland has grown, so too has the tragedy that is food poverty. That's why, irrespective of the outcome of the current impasse over a future in the EU, we should be better prioritising the fight against food poverty, including enshrining in law a statutory right to food and a good food nations bill that this Parliament has consistently voted for and which this government needs to get on with delivering. And, President Officer, I want to conclude with this point. The fight against poverty goes beyond our shores. Scotland is a proud, fair, na fair trade nation and many businesses and consumers in Scotland support and indeed trade fair trade products. If the UK leaves the EU, the next few years we will we'll see our trade rules rewritten and new trade deals negotiated. That will mean big changes for us all, but for millions of farmers and workers in the world's poorest countries who rely on trading with us, it will be make or break for them. The fair trade principle of a fair price for a fair day's work therefore must be at the heart of those trade deals. If it is not, then it will be yet another example of the damage Brexit will do to the food and drink sector, both here in Scotland and across the world. Thank you. Uh, before I call the next speaker, and certainly before I vacate the chair, I'd like to have a few words. Um, I have heard rumblings and I, I have had some notes um, about what's seen as electioneering in the chamber. Now, all I would say is that has ever been thus, we are all political people from political parties. Um, I would suggest that, uh, if you'll excuse me saying, we're all big enough and ugly enough to know what's sensible and what's not. And uh, we'd ask that just everyone has a bit of care about being overtly blatant and recognising that we all have political things to say. And perhaps we can all get on quite well with that. And I now call Stuart Stevenson, followed by Rachel Hamill. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I will uh, look in the mirror and see if I fit the description you've just used. Um, let me just say I have a chair in a very small registered agricultural holding, uh, which is used for sheep, so that touches on the matter. Um, we've got a number of things in relation to the debate around uh, the UK's planned departure from Brexit that have been put before us. Uh, Donald Cameron said that we have to vote for the deal that's available because it's the only deal. Well, of course, there's a reason it's the only deal. It's because it's the only deal that Theresa May asked for. In a Mansion House speech in 2017, she drew the red lines which constrained the ultimate deal to be the deal that's before us. But, of course, the deal that's before us is rather opaque because the uh, withdrawal agreement bill has not even been shown to the UK uh, cabinet as yet. It won't be published until, I predict, after the 23rd of May. And the reason for that is it will cause such internal chaos in the Tory party that Theresa May is trying to keep the publication of the bill as late as possible in the debate because she knows she cannot command the support of her own party. In these circumstances, it's very hard to work out why anyone else should support uh, the withdrawal agreement bill. The only on-the-record reference I've got is today from Sir Graham Brady, uh, who, who's the chairman of the 1922 committee, who Point says... Point of order, John Scott. Stevenson, address the motion, please. It hasn't thus far. I think Mr Scott does have a bit of validity in what he's just said, if you could bear it in mind. Uh, well, uh, Presiding Officer, I, I did start with the word Brexit. I think it was 4 minutes 33 seconds before the Labour contribution did so, and it's core of what we are. Mr but Stevenson, I if you to could you address said. food and drink, I think we'd all be a lot happier. Well, until we see what the bill says, 
some of the impacts on food and drink are definitely not going to be clear. But it is clear that uh, being out of the single market and out of the customs union are very severe impacts on food and drink. Matters that were proposed a month before the Mansion House Street uh, speech in December uh, 2016. So, presiding officer, the whole issue of the future success of our food and drink uh, sector is one that will be determined to a very large extent by what happens uh, in relation to the departure of the UK uh, from the EU. Now, we've all, in every single constituency, be it urban or rural, we've got important food and drink uh, interests. Uh, I want to talk about just a very small uh, company in my own uh, constituency, and that's Summer House Drinks. Um, they're a particular favourite of my wife's. She loves their lemonade in particular. And of course, doesn't that touch on something? Because we don't grow ter terribly many lemons. A lot of the drinks, of course, are entirely local products, lavender, mint, that are grown locally. But uh, the lemons are going to be an imported thing. And who knows what the condition of the lemons she's going to be able to import and the price uh, that Claire Rennie on the Rennie family farm is going to have to pay for them in future. Um, it's worth saying that there's a lot of preparation associated with Brexit. We in this parliament have been doing a great deal. There's a preparefor-brexit.scot website that's been established to help Scottish businesses. And it talks of a number of the real issues for food and drink and for others. If you're exporters or importers, there may be huge increases in costs. 53% of UK goods generally uh, are imported, and that includes many of the materials that are required by the food and drink uh, industry. If you want to recruit, we've already heard about the uh, fruit uh, industry who cannot get people into the country. And Michael Gove yesterday gave us no meaningful assurance that we'll be able to see people travel to the UK and in particular to Scotland to harvest our excellent uh, fruit and to continue to support our excellent uh, fish processing industry. I brought uh, the debate to the Parliament uh, on the Sea of Opportunity because leaving the CFP that the Tories took us into uh, is certainly something which will benefit uh, the fish catching industry insofar as they can catch more fish. But the economic benefit is denied us if our processing industry is unable to process the extra fish that are caught. Catching 50% more fish and earning three, half the value means you're actually worse off. So getting our processing industry in a good place is what we have to do. And my three whiskey distilleries, if we lose, as the Americans want in their negotiating position, to ab abandon the three year in a warehouse uh, position, that will devastate the quality product that earns so much for our food and drink industry. Presiding officer. Rachel Hamilton, followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, we've heard today that Scotland's food and drink industry has been such a success story for many years now, and the industry continues to grow and grow. And um, we know that uh, food and drink in Scotland is the largest international export industry with a strong re reputation, wh whether it be for uh, Scottish whisky or for fine Aberdeen Angus beef. Farmers are at the heart of food production. And as we leave the EU, we have a fantastic chance to design and construct an agricultural support system that really delivers for Scotland. And we have in our own Scottish Conservative motion that recognises the need for change, a system perhaps which promotes environmentalism, as Mark Russell talks about, drives productivity, increases food production, and one that ensures farmers can innovate to be ahead of the technological cu uh, curve. Under years of cap, Farming has not necessarily had the chance to properly thrive. The one-size-fits-all policy has to suit farmers and producers from the Arctic Circle to the Mediterranean Sea and everywhere in between. The cap has taken us so far, but with rising farm debt and falling incomes, it is starting to ring alarm bells. We need a new system that continues to support and grow agricultural output, which in turn drives our food and drink sector further, which is the ambition of the Scottish Government. But however, we have seen very little progress from this SNP Government so far. The SNP has left farmers in the dark by refusing to include Scotland in the UK Agricultural Bill. The SNP said they would bring forward their own bill, 
but have not included it in the programme for government. Agriculture is devolved and will be devolved for many years to come. But the Scottish Government need to get their act together and get that ball, roll, ball rolling on the bill. To top it off, they've closed the new entrance scheme, pulling up the drawbridge to new talent, which could have boosted our food and drink industry. And the SNP have effectively prohibited entrepreneurial minded people from entering into the agricultural industry, which is quite astonishing that we hear the Cabinet Secretary routinely remind us that the average age of the farmer is 59. Scotland's food and drink sector is a welcome success, but its biggest threat is this government and their lack of action. Presiding officer, if we are to engage the next generation in food and drink and get this sector growing even further, this must start in schools. I've raised this issue before in the chamber when I called on the Scottish Government to consider introducing uh, a National 5 qualification in agriculture. We need to see lessons to improve tackling food waste, educating children on provenance on their food. And for far too long, there's been a disconnect between the classroom and the farmyard. And in order to realise the potential of the food industry, we need to engage our younger generation. In my own constituency next week, um, there will be the Border Union Agricultural Society running their schools day and it's an invaluable way of reaching to school children and I urge local authorities to take this on board right across the whole of Scotland. With our wonderful locally grown and high quality food it's no wonder that people as many have mentioned today are disappointed that the Good Food Nation bill has been ditched. It would have brought tremendous benefits to this industry, could have offered potential to Scottish farmers to put themselves at the heart of local procurement. Scottish schools are currently spending more than a million pounds sourcing meat from outside of Scotland, including hundreds of thousands of pounds on chicken from Thailand. When it comes to this in particular, we need to see local authorities offer more contracts to local producers, not only to boost the economy, but to reduce food miles and tackle climate change. Imagine children learning about locally produced and ethical food in the classroom visiting the farm and enjoying it every day in the canteen, wouldn't that be fantastic? It is entirely possible if the SNP would just bring back the Good Food Nation Bill, just for the sake of the children, um, but also to tackle uh, the rising obesity levels and the need, the much needed um, stimulus for the rural economy. Presiding officer, Scotland's food and drink sector is an integral and extremely valuable part of our economy, but it could be much more. We have a unique opportunity to grasp these significant opportunities that Brexit will bring. We must place Scottish products on an international stage and we have this opportunity to build a tailored farm support system that encourages better farming practices and puts farmers at the centre of driving innovation and productivity in their businesses. It's the farmers at the end of the day who we must thank for producing the excellent raw ingredients upon the Scottish success story. We should also commend entrepreneurialism, the determination and the hard work of Scottish producers who never fail to amaze us in their constant pursuit of exciting new products. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Gail Ross to be followed by Alec Rowley. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. In Scotland, we rightly pride ourselves on our world-class food and drink sector. Worth billions, we've set ambitious targets to double growth by 2030. Whiskey and salmon are our two biggest exports, the production of both of which employs many people in my constituency. No one knows if we are to leave the EU with a deal. No one knows if we are to leave the EU or not, such as the mess the Westminster government have made of the negotiations. But there is no doubt that in every sense, whether we leave with a deal or not, Brexit is the biggest current threat to our rural areas, our tourism and our food and drink sector. We have thousands of small and medium-sized businesses and producers and a worldwide reputation for excellence. And within that sector, we have products that have been given special EU protections, as Bruce Crawford has already mentioned, PGI status. Now, these indications protected in the EU represent an agricultural food or drink product with deep local roots, whose protection under EU law has generated significant value for its producers and both the local and national economy. Products such as Scotch whisky, Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, Orkney cheddar, and Arbroath smokies. 
In the event of a no deal, the UK government has stated that existing holders of protected status should prepare to reapply to the EU for protection and the use of the EU logo. Now, this is significantly different from the previous position, which sought to reassure current holders that their status would be maintained and protected, irrespective of our future relationship with the EU. Yesterday, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee questioned the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Michael Gove, and I asked him about this specific issue. I asked him if this would incur costs, and if so, who would pay for them? He replied that the UK government would cover any unnecessary costs, but what unnecessary costs are remains to be explained. Presiding officer, industry body Scotland Food and Drink have stated that a no deal Brexit would be catastrophic for the sector. Chief Executive James Withers said, and I quote, any form of Brexit is a backward step for the Scottish food and drink industry. At best, it will hit our ambition to double the industry's turnover by 2030. But if it's a no deal Brexit, it will pull the rug from underneath the business. Presiding officer, a no deal Brexit is unthinkable for the sector. Just at the start of this year, as Annabelle has said, sorry, Annabelle Ewing has said, industry representatives from Scotland Food and Drink, the Food and Drink Federation, Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation, Quality Meat Scotland, Scottish Bakers and the Scottish Agricultural Organisational Society wrote to Theresa May to implore her to take no deal off the table. She refuses to do so. Westminster government's own projections say that this will result in an estimated annual loss to the industry of £2 billion. This is a sector, presiding officer, that relies on migrant labour. Research by Skills Development Scotland has said that the food and drink sector will need to fill 27,000 jobs by 2022, but that's before the impact of Brexit, which will have a significant effect on the availability of the labour. And another question that was put to Mr Gove yesterday was how are we going to fill these positions when the immigration proposal from Westminster is that in the future people coming to Scotland to work here will need to be earning at least £30,000. Unfortunately, Mr Gove's response was less than encouraging. He said that he recognises that we need people for the sector. But the Westminster pilot project, which is lauded on the other side of this chamber, has fallen woefully short of providing the amount of workers that is needed for that sector. And whilst it is encouraging to hear that he has raised the issue with the Home Secretary, there was no reassurance that the concerns and needs of the Scottish food and drink sector will be taken into account. We need control over our own immigration policy. Presiding officer, there has been nothing, despite what others will say, nothing that has been as divisive as Brexit. And the sooner we can get certainty for our people, our business and our economy, the better. Thank you very much. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Alistair Allen. Mr Rowley, please. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. A point of order. Um, I just wanted to declare an interest. Um, I'm not a farmer. I'm not no. a food manufacturer, but I do um, have an interest in a business that sells food and drink. That's fine. Thank well you. done. Uh, Alec Rowley to be followed by Alistair Allen, please. Yeah. Thank you, President Officer. The potential impact of Brexit for the food and drink sector is huge, be it on trade, inward investment, labour and employment, or policy and regulation. Brexit is not just a concern for UK food producers, but also for any food manufacturer, EU or non-EU, serving the UK market. With more than 50% of food currently being imported into the UK, there is no definitive blueprint as to what any new trading relationship would like, look like. And even if we were to get uh, a deal through Westminster, it will take years to put that detail in place. That's why the only comment I would make uh, on Donald Cameron talking about an independence referendum, the only comment I would make is that I don't believe that we would be in any position the next year to be able to have any type of referendum other than a second EU referendum because we would need to find a way forward and put all these regulations etc in place. 
But the fact that we are dependent in this country, or the UK is dependent on 50% of our food being imported, should also, I believe, ring some alarm bells. A no deal Brexit may mean higher prices for food shortages to ensure that Scotland's people are protected from the worst effects. Surely we need a good food nation bill enshrining the right to food. And I would have to say to the Cabinet Secretary that I think he really does need to start to pull together where we're actually heading in terms of a good uh, food nation bill. Um, Scottish Labour supports Scotland's food and drink strategy, Ambition 2030, but the continuing uncertainty over Brexit will make meeting that target challenging. And I know that James Withers, the Chief Executive for the Scotland Food and Drink, a comment that he made where he said, any form of Brexit is a backward step for the Scottish food and drink industry. At best, it will hit our ambitions to double the industry turnover by 2030. But if it's a no deal, it will pull the rug from underneath the businesses. And when I hear Conservative member after Conservative member declaring interest in, in being farmers and working within the food industry, then I cannot for the life of me understand why you would defend the government in Westminster and the absolute shambles that they have made of Brexit and the uncertainty that's there. A few people, presiding officer, have talked about the elections next week. Next week. My fear is that, that, and I go out this morning in a, a newspaper shop in Kelty, when you're out campaigning, people are sick to the teeth. People are not quite sure who to believe. And that's, that's the fact about, about Brexit. And the, the, the real threat here is a threat against democracy or the rise of the right, because politicians have told so many lies and got us into such a mess over these issues and the threats that, that, that come for that. Um, as Mark Rusko has pointed out, there is already a, an uncertain time for food and drink industry with climate change, biodiversity loss, and public health concerns changing how we produce and consume food. Now, Mark Ruskell pointed out that in terms of the common agricultural policy, other countries in Europe, regardless of Brexit, are starting to work out what a new common agricultural policy will look like. I'm not sure that here in Scotland we are even at the starting line when it starts coming to examining how we move forward and what, what a good food nation would look like. Over 200,000 children are in families that are unable to afford to eat healthily. Food banks are in communities up and down Scotland. Surely it's for the government to bring forward legislation to enshrine the right to food so that everyone in Scotland can access food. Surely in terms of climate change, when we, when we see that agriculture accounts for 26.1% of total greenhouse gases. How could we have a climate emergency when we are not actually addressing 26% of the total greenhouse gas emissions coming through agriculture? Now, again, when I sat on the Environment Committee, I know that a number of farmers that were on that committee would say that the farming industry wants to address these issues. The farming industry wants to get best practice, but again, I'm not sure that the Scottish Government are at the starting line when we start to look at how we're right. going to address well, these issues. Well, you're at the finishing issues. line. You'll have so to sit down. No, I, would finish, I was finished, you're, presiding you're officer, finished. You're finished. by, you're finished by simply your, saying finished, we Mr. need Rowley. to get a good food Alistair industry Alan, in place. Alistair Allen, by John Scott. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, we often point out here how food and drink are a significant part of Scotland's economy. We can't say that too often as a parliament. Uh, uh, we need to keep saying it until the point is more widely understood. So, like other members, I will shamelessly mention examples of all this from my own constituency. In the Hayland and Anir, the food and drink sector accounts for £18 million in gross value added to the island's economy. 
In many ways, the industry is closely related, of course, to the tourism sector in the Outer Hebrides, which itself uh, was worth approximately £53 million in 2013 uh, and has almost certainly grown considerably since then. Stormy Black Pudding and Harris Gin are, of course, among the best-known island products. Harris is soon to produce both whisky and beer too. Lewis and soon North Eust also have their own small distilleries. Uh, the Western Isles are famous for salmon, seafood, lamb, venison, as well as being home to a biscuit factory and many smaller food enterprises. And behind much of all of this, of course, uh, lies crofting and fishing, making the overall impact uh, of food and drink on the community uh, much wider uh, than I've mentioned. Now, there are uh, many challenges which the food and drink industry faces, not least of these being, and uh, I'm sorry to have to mention this word so early on in the conversation, Brexit. The industry nationally has assessed that leaving the EU without a deal will result in the loss of £2 billion in sales annually, an assessment that was based on the UK government's own economic projections. Moreover, the industry ha has said that businesses have already invested millions of pounds in time and money trying to mitigate and minimise the consequences of leaving without a deal. Now, even if the Prime Minister's bad deal were to go through, however, we would still be leaving the EU without any of the benefits for the food and drink industry that the EU single market provide. The shellfish industry in particular needs that market and has to be able to get live shellfish very quickly from the Outer Hebrides to Spain without waiting at international borders. Island seafood exporters already face enough obstacles as it is in getting their produce to continental markets in time and the very last thing they need uh, is the addition of further barriers to trade caused by Brexit. I should also say that non-tariff barriers are also a concern to the salmon industry. And I would have serious concerns if Brexit has any effect on the diligent workforce that presently staffs much of our fish processing industry. Uh, of these uh, workforce, uh, the majority or many are from other European countries, largely coming from Poland, Lithuania and Latvia, so demonstrating uh, the dependence of the sector on its European workforce. Any moves to, to limit migration have the potential to seriously harm our rural and remote communities and will have a major impact on the future success of the food and drink industry. I want to mention a couple of things that have come up in the debate that I feel are, are, are relevant to, to the industry as, as it would, um, as it would uh, practice or would operate in, in the islands. Firstly, when it comes to the Green Amendment, I do understand the, the motivations that, that lie behind it, um, but I would merely ask the movers of that amendment to understand that asking crofters in my constituency to move from livestock to arable uh, is no small ask, uh, and indeed, uh, with only 8% of, of Scotland's land mass really suitable commercially for, for arable farming, uh, I, I would respectfully suggest that that, that is uh, quite a tall order. Um, uh, nationally to achieve that. And, and specifically on one other issue that, that's come up uh, in the last few days, uh, I would uh, mention the fact that uh, there is at least one other European member state who has shown a bit more uh, interest uh, in its farming community, uh, and that is namely Ireland, uh, who have uh, offered uh, in the last few days 50 million euros by way of apology for the, the mess that Britain has caused with Brexit. I, I look forward uh, to the United Kingdom government offering a similar apology to our farmers and crofters here. Finally, as, as an EU member state, um, the UK participates in the EU's uh, approach to uh, protected GIs, and uh, many others have, have uh, mentioned uh, the uh, geographic indicators as an important feature uh, I could list all the ones that apply to the Western Isles, I won't, and others have mentioned the ones that apply elsewhere. Uh, I understand the Scottish Government has written to the UK Government on a number of occasions over the past year, spelling out the vital importance of these protected names. Finally, Presiding Officer, I hope that meaningful replies are being received from Westminster about that, though I, I do not hold my breath on the Scottish Government's behalf over that. Thank you very much. I call John Scott to be followed by Joan McAlphy. Ms McAlphy is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Scott. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer, a food producer, a pioneer of farmers' markets and other interests in my register of interests. 
Can I also note with regret the gratuitously divisive and negative tone of the Scottish Government motion which docks down the future of our food and drink industry? That Fergus Ewing's motion does so needlessly is a surprise to me because Mr Ewing is not an unreasonable man and is an arch pragmatist and he well knows that many of the concerns he and his SNP colleagues have raised today are within his and their grasp to resolve but he and they choose not to do so. And by this I mean that the many fears he raises over the no-deal Brexit could be resolved by voting for the Brexit deal negotiated by the UK government with the UK. No. Time after time, we hear SNP MPs, led by Ian Blackford, but driven by the First Minister, dismiss the UK government's proposed deal with the EU without ever offering any credible alternative. And Bruce Crawford reinforced this attitude again today. And so we know that the Scottish Government is not serious, perhaps in a moment, about wanting to help create a solution to the many potential problems highlighted today by this SNP Government, as we on these benches realise, and certainly rural Scotland fully understands, that the SNP want to sow only divisions and discord with a view to using Brexit to break up the United Kingdom. Mr Ewing. Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I have always respected Mr Scott's uh, knowledge and appreciation and support for Scottish agriculture and I will continue to do so. Uh, but could I just point out that we have previously uh, put forward alternative proposals for a Brexit deal, although we don't think that's the preferred deal. And we did so more than two years ago uh, uh, in setting forward an option which was ignored at the time. And we simply do believe profoundly that, that, that Brexit is not the best way ahead in Scotland. But I do agree that with Mr Scott that you know, I prefer debates to be in a reasonable, constructive fashion. And I just thought it useful to reiterate that now. Uh, Mr Scott, I'll give you I, your I time thank back. Mr Ewing for his intervention. And he, uh, coming from Turnbury, an area as I do, you will remember Bruce's um, strictures to, if at first you don't succeed, try again. Perhaps because, presiding officer, the people who really matter in today's debate, the farmers, the processors, the retailers, the tens of thousands of people who have to live in the real world and whose jobs are at stake, have all backed the UK government de negotiated deal. The National Farmers Union of Scotland has backed the deal. The Scotch Whisky Association has backed the deal. The Scottish Chamber of Commerce has backed the deal, as well as individual companies such as Diageo. Scottish fishermen back the deal. Scottish salmon producers do not want a no-deal Brexit, as apparently almost advocated today by the SNP. And history will remember and judge this SNP government's unwillingness to compromise and their unwillingness to work with the UK government to find solutions or offer meaningful ways of improving and sustaining the UK government's negotiating position within Europe. On the other hand, the UK government has guaranteed support to our farmers until 2024, but this SNP government chooses not to believe this offer as they know that they themselves cannot make such an offer to Scotland's farmers and crofters and land managers without the support of the UK government standing behind them as the SNP government in the meantime pursue independence. Similarly, the declaration by the First Minister of a climate change emergency makes for a great headline, but the First Ministers know, as does her Cabinet Secretary, that the cost of meeting the targets suggested by the Climate Change Committee cannot be met as things stand by the Scottish Government without the UK Government and UK taxpayers providing the finance for the SNP Government's objectives. And, Presiding Officer, even... No, I will not. Thank you. And, Presiding Officer, even if the SNP Government refused to see or offer anything positive in this debate, Scottish Conservatives know how important the views of our food and drink exports Ports are and will remain in Scotland. <clears throat> With over 60% of our exports already going to the rest of the UK, that market will remain and grow unless the SNP government deliberately sets out to make it harder to access. Our food and drink exports will continue to grow, particularly our whisky exports. And again, the UK government has delivered practical financial support to this industry by freezing the duty on spirits at the last budget. On the other hand, the actions of this SNP government are driving many producers, particularly red meat producers, to the wall 
and reducing the amount of basic produce available to our food processors to come even close to the food and drink industry 2030 targets using homegrown primary produce. Failing IT systems, rewilding of Scotland's landscapes, a determination that farmers and landowners should be portrayed as not pulling their weight in the efforts to reduce climate change without making any effort to recognise the contribution they make, all send signals of discouragement to an industry that under this SNP government is becoming less profitable and daily more indebted to high street banks. So, presiding officer, Parliament should today reject this divisive SNP motion calculated to further talk down rural Scotland and Scotland's food and drink industry and accept the Scottish Conservative motion as the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Joan McAlpine, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it's instructive to compare and contrast Scotland's ambition for its food and drink industry with the chilling effect that Brexit poses. The Scottish Government aims to double the value of food and drink, as we've heard, by 30 billion uh, uh, by 2030. That is setting the bar high, presiding officer, but aiming high is what we should be doing. And we've made so much progress already. Uh, our overseas food and drink exports have increased by 78% or 2.8 billion since 2007. But all this progress is in peril. Um, the EU, without a doubt, is Scotland's largest uh, market uh, for our, our food and drink. No, I will not, I don't have time. The area that I represent in the south of Scotland, the success of food and drink reflects the national picture and indeed more so because as an agricultural area, the quality, um, uh, the high quality of our natural produce uh, helps underpin many businesses. Uh, as has already been mentioned by Colin Smythe, almost half or 48% of Scotland's dairy herd, for example, is in Dumfries and Galloway and almost one in every four cattle in the whole of Scotland can be found in the region. And has already been said, um, Dumfries and Galloway Council, which of course is led by an SNP Labour coalition, recently launched a food and drink strategy and action plan for the region, mirroring that national ambition. Uh, the strategy is absolutely clear about the biggest threat to the growth of the, uh, of the region's food and drink, and that's Brexit. And we heard why uh, today from colleagues. Um, access to labour, geographical indicators, just-in-time production, uh, trade barriers. Uh, but I wanted to focus on uh, one, one thing that my committee has been looking at recently, which is causing me particular concern, and that is the effect of future trade deals on the food and drink sector uh, in this country. Um, we know that future trade deals, particularly with America, could result in a diminution of uh, standards in terms of our food and drink uh, industry and lead to the flooding of the market with uh, uh, poor quality products. Uh, but international trade experts giving evidence to the Parliament's Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee have made it clear that consultation at every level of government and across all sectors is absolutely essential uh, in order to reach a, a, a suitable agreed negotiating position which will protect uh, economic sectors like food and drink that have a strong geographical footprint. I, they're, they're important to some areas of the country uh, more so than others. Uh, the UK government has still not outlined how they are going to include the devolved administrations in determining trade priorities. And the, the record isn't good on this in March. A unilateral decision was taken by the Department of International Trade in Westminster to unilaterally drop tariffs in certain key sectors of uh, the economy in the event of a no deal. And this was ostensibly to ensure that we uh, kept supplies coming in. Uh, for clarity, though, what it meant is that imports would not face tariffs, but our producers uh, exporting would still face tariffs. Now, the UK government. Uh, said that uh, the sectors that they chose for this liberalisation were chosen because they were not considered to be vital areas of the economy. But one of the areas affected was the dairy industry, an industry of huge importance, as I have said, to the southwest of Scotland. Now, currently, EU most favoured nation dairy tariffs are on average 72.3%. And in the event of a no-deal scenario, 
The UK government is proposing to drop that to 0%, but of course we have absolutely no guarantee that the EU will reciprocate. Um, when we took evidence, uh, Dmitry Gozobrinsky, a former Australian WTO trade negotiator, told the committee it's entirely possible that without adequate consultation and feed-in, dairy was just not considered important enough uh, to be included. Um, now, we later took evidence from uh, the Trade Minister for Scotland, Ivan McKee, and asked him how he had been consulted on the liberalisation of these tariffs. And he told us that the night before the decision was announced, he was pulled out of a, a dinner with his officials up on Calton Hill and the uh, voice down the line from Westminster explained that, you know, these uh, tariffs were, this announcement was going to be made the next day. Um, that is the level of respect and the level of consultation that the UK government shows the Scottish government and indeed shows vital areas of our economy like the dairy industry. Um, now, if that is the way they intend to proceed uh, in the future, uh, I have very, very great um, uh, misgivings, uh, not just for the dairy sector, not just for the food and drink sector, but for the whole of the Scottish economy after Brexit. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Uh, closing speech is now called Mark Ruskell to close for the Greens. Six minutes, Mr Ruskell. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I suppose it's, um, you know, it's true to form that we're always going to divide over constitutional questions, particularly given that there's an election on next week. Um, but I, I will reach out to uh, Donald Cameron and, and Rhoda Grant because in some ways, you know, I, I do actually agree with you. I, I do believe that the uh, Scottish Government needs to get on with the day job. It needs to deliver under the devolved powers that this Parliament actually has. It needs to deliver a good food nation bill with a strong right to food in there um, and tackle disadvantage and protect the environment. And it does need an agriculture bill and an agriculture strategy and an environment strategy as well. But, you know, it's important that the government delivers this vision to show what this parliament can actually achieve, even with the limited powers that we have. And I believe if we can show the people of Scotland what this, what this parliament can achieve with even the limited powers, that we will build the case for this parliament to have all the powers of a normal, independent country. Now, in creating that vision, in, in creating that inspiring vision of what we can be. We heard a number of members uh, talk about the, the real leadership that's being shown by many people working in our food and drink sector. I think Colin Smith spoke very passionately about the work of David and Wilma Finlay at the Ethical Dairy. Uh, tremendous food pioneers who've developed high welfare, highly innovative forms of organic farming that are also incredibly productive, uh, producing you know, products which are, are, are much loved uh, within Scotland's food economy. And I think, you know, Rachel Hamilton spoke very well, too, about the link between innovation and environmentalism, absolutely, and the need to bring in new entrants into our food economy and our farming economy. You know, this is what the Green New Deal is all about. It's all about transformation, and not just about transformation in the oil and gas sector. It's about transformation in our food and farming sector as well. But that needs an active state. It needs an active government investing, taking innovation, and driving it forward with the private sector. And I would say to Alistair Allen, I mean, I, I, I recognize the challenges, particularly the challenges of, of the Crofton communities, but I think there are strong opportunities here as well. There are strong opportunities to really recognize the public goods that farmers in the uplands and in Crofton communities are already delivering at the moment. We just need to find a better way to support them through financial mechanisms uh, and the market as well. And, and yeah, there are ways forward here through innovation, through reducing stocking density, through valuing the carbon sequestration that can happen on common grazings, and we need to support that. Um, what else did we learn this afternoon? Um, well, we talked a bit about freedom of movement, and we learned that Mr. Chapman doesn't like freedom of movement, but he is a big fan of letting people into Scotland. So that, that's great. And there were, you know, we heard from lots of others who want to let more people into Scotland as well, like the National Farmers Union, um, who uh, you know, pointed out that we've only let in 2,500 people into the UK as seasonal workers, when actually we needed to have let in uh, 10,000 people. And Gail Ross spoke about this uh, issue as well. And I think it's quite clear that we can't have a withdrawal deal 
based on only protecting one of the European Union freedoms. We need to defend freedom of movement. And that's why, you know, I would say perhaps comradely to the Labour Party that the Labour Party position uh, on protecting a customs union but not embracing the single market is deeply flawed. And you've only got to look at the issue of the, of the food service sector, because we've talked a lot about, you know, trade in, in, in fantastic products um, that we all enjoy, such as, you know, whiskey and salmon and everything else. But, of course, the food service industry is hugely important. It's the biggest employer in the UK food uh, supply chain. It employs 1.7 million people. And 40% of people working in food services are actually migrant labor. And, uh, you know, this was a, a, a point also highlighted by the Cabinet Secretary and Alistair Allen in relation to seafood, but I think also Alec Rowley raised, you know, the, the, this, this, this image of, you know, food rotting in the fields, ungathered at the same time as hungry children are having to wait outside of food banks in Fife. It's an utter disgrace. It's an utter disgrace. Um, I think then that we need to ensure that Scotland remains an attractive place to welcome European Union citizens, and I was very uh, proud recently to work with uh, my friend Bruce Crawford and Ben McPherson in organizing a meeting in Stirling where we really threw open the doors to European Union citizens. We had over 60 people uh, come along from widely different backgrounds uh, talking about their experiences now, talking about just how hard it is to get settled status, the kind of the, the fact that you have to prove who you are, where, you be, where you've been living. You have to prove your worth. You have to prove your citizenship. It's disgraceful. And this is no way to treat people. It's a hostile immigration policy. And what, what, what worried me, uh, many things worried me at that event, but what, what worried me, particularly in the context of this debate, is speaking to people who are working in the food industry, who are now thinking about voting with their feet and leaving this country. And I think that's absolutely disgraceful. We should be defending their rights all the way. Thank you very much. I now call Rhoda Grant to please for Labour. Six minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, many speakers uh, this afternoon rightly talked about the importance of food and drink to the Scottish economy. Um, and some took that a step further and used it as an opportunity to name check every food and drink organisation in their constituency. And if I did that representing the Highlands and Islands, I would have well exceeded my time um, in the debate this afternoon. So I won't suffice to say that I think we top the tree with good food and drink uh, businesses within the Highlands and Islands. Another major point of agreement in the debate was that nobody saw that a no-deal Brexit could be a good thing. Everyone had agree, has agreed that it should be avoided at all costs, and that is because of the damage it would do, not only to the food and drink industry, but indeed to all of our industries. And if I can as well point to another point of agreement um, during the debate, and that is the support of a good food nation bill. It seems to me that the whole of the Parliament support it, and therefore there is no reason for delay. It would get a fair win through the Parliament, and I would urge the Scottish Government to bring it forward. Now, it will be a complex bill, because if we're looking to simplify the whole food chain, then of course that is going to take time and discussion. But the sooner they come forward with proposals, the sooner that discussion can happen, and the sooner that the Parliament and all parties can get round the table and add to that. Um, the Good Food Nation Bill is backed by the Co-op Party, of whom I'm a member, but also the Food Coalition, which is made up of many organisations, NGOs, trade unions, and indeed um, organisations that deal with people um, who are suffering from poverty. And Colin Smith pointed out that poverty is on, on the rise. 200,000 children in Scotland are brought up in families that can't afford to eat healthily. Rachel Hamilton talked about obesity, but all of this is storing up problems for the future when we get um, diseases re um, related to malnutrition coming back and indeed poor health and life expectancy falling. So we desperately need um, a good food bill um, that deals with all of those issues. Um, and Al Greilly also pointed out the impact on Brexit of food and how that could further contribute to the hunger that we're already seeing in our um, communities. So therefore, we must have a good food nation bill. It must be a government priority and it must enshrine a right to food. The other issue I think people were, were genuinely um, 
agreeable around was climate change. And I think everyone has signed up to the emergency that climate change um, pre um, presents us with. Alec Riley and Mark Ruskell talked about um, a new cap and how the European Union is already looking at what needs to be in um, the post-21 cap scheme. We need to look at that too, because whether we are in or out of Europe, we need to bring forward a scheme and we need to now be looking at what that scheme would be. We haven't seemed to start to put a framework in place for that. Our farmers and crofters need to know what, what it will look like and it needs to tackle climate change at the very heart of it. Um, and as Alec Riley pointed out, the new scheme has to be linked up to a Good Food Nation Bill because the two things work hand in hand if we're going to deal with climate change and food poverty. Colin Smith raised an issue that nobody else raised, but I think it really does require emphasising, and that was um, the issue of fair trade. We pride ourselves on supporting fair trade, and we must ensure that it doesn't get lost in Brexit negotiations uh, and doesn't lead to huge tariffs being put onto businesses and indeed countries where there are vulnerable producers, vulnerable workforces. And we need to make sure that while we are concerned for ourselves and the dangers that we face ahead, we must never forget to protect those that are weaker than ourselves in that situation. A number of speakers, um, Colin Smith, Gail Ross, Bruce Crawford, um, talked about PGI, and this is an issue close to my heart, having campaigned for a long time over that protection for storing away black pudding. And I certainly wouldn't want to see that watered down in any way. So any deal has to look at the protections we already have. And if we're trading with the European Union, that those protections exist throughout um, the Union and indeed further afield if need be to protect our excellence um, in producing food. A number of speakers also spoke about workforce issues and there are several concerns. There's concerns obviously about migrant workers coming in um, for the farming industry and indeed berry picking is a big issue. Um, and they need reassurance on that because people need to know if they are going to plant a crop, is it going to rot in the ground or are they going to have the workforce um, to, to harvest it? But also there are issues, um, our fishing community talk about um, coming out of the common fisheries policy uh, and how that's going to provide um, huge opportunity. But we don't have people to process that fish. And unless we invest in those, that workforce and make sure that that is in place, whether it, and you know, speaking to fishermen in Shetland, they're telling me that there is no capacity in Shetland to do that processing. We need to look elsewhere within Scotland because that is an opportunity for us um, that we should not miss if Brexit happens. In conclusion, presiding officer, our amendment is very simple. It adds to the government motion about the importance of both our EU and UK markets, the need for a good food nation bill to simplify the food chain and end hunger, and to have a subsidy scheme that takes us to net zero for the agriculture industry. I don't know how other parties can vote against it. I wonder how the Liberal Democrats will explain that to their members and I would urge them to change their minds on this matter. Thank you very much. And I call Edward Mountain to close the Conservative six minutes, Mr Mountain. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I welcome today's debate, uh, as I believe it's given us on the benches over here another opportunity to say how much we support Scotland's food and drink sector. We do have a vision to ensure Scotland's food and drink goes on to achieve more of a success than it is already, a vision that we published in our new approach to Scottish farming document some months ago. But I say this, I believe it's time we had some vision from this SNP government but to me, it's been sorely lacking. And as the Cabinet Secretary knows, promises are often easily made, but more difficult to deliver. Where is the good food nation that was promised back in May 2017? Where is the Scottish Agriculture Bill that was talked about over two months ago? Cabinet Secretary, they're nowhere to be seen. They're not even in your programme for government. It's no wonder that the farming and food experts are beginning to lose confidence in this government. And I don't need to remind the Cabinet Secretary, it was Johnny Hall, the Director of Policy for NFUS, that stated only last week that in many senses there is no vision from the Scottish Government in terms of where it wants to be. I couldn't agree more. I agree with him and I agree with the farmers in the countryside. 
If we are to grow our food and drink industry so that it is worth the 30 billion that we all aspire it to be by 2030, we need to ensure that the government has ambitions to match the ambitions of farmers and fishermen and producers across all of Scotland. So, Cabinet Secretary, I'm calling on you in my closing speech to stop dithering and start delivering. And that point was made by Donald Cameron and Peter Chapman, both who highlighted that the common fisheries policy has been bad for Scotland and there was plenty of opportunities once we get out of it. They highlighted the fact that Scotch whisky is clearly supportive of a deal and an exit deal that's been put forward. And they reiterated the statement that the Scottish government lacked vision and that was what was being said in the fields across Scotland. I'm afraid I'm very pushed for time and I, I may get an opportunity later. I believe, as does Peter Chapman, that farmers are optimists and they always look to grasp opportunities and they have the highest standards of production, which is indeed what makes us and all food producers in Scotland world leaders. And Rachel Hamilton made the point that CAP doesn't deliver. It hasn't. And I agree with her that it would be much more beneficial to bring farms to the classrooms to ensure that our children and the future generations, I'm afraid I'm quite short of time, and, and I'll see if I can in a minute when I come to your uh, party's contributions. I believe that we should bring farms to the classrooms so that our future generations are educated. And I also agree with her that we should be more, using more of Scottish produce in our schools. It's a subject this benches have hammered home on every possible occasion. But still, we are taking chicken from Thailand. That's not good enough. And I also agree with John Scott and the points that he made, that it is clear that the UK government does have a vision a provision that sees support going through in its current state till 2024. This Scottish government hasn't made that point. Now, I want to try and pick a point where I agree with the Cabinet Secretary on. I don't always agree with him, but here is a point I agree on, that it is the farmers who make our countryside worth visiting. It is their hard work and their success in shaping the countryside and shaping the environment that we should be proud of. And I just asked the Cabinet Secretary, which I a pity that I haven't heard anything about today, was why he's not prepared to see a schedule in the UK Agriculture Bill to support our farmers. Now, I also heard from Bruce Crawford how he recognised the importance of a no-deal Brexit being not good for farmers. I agree. And I also agree with him, as did Michael Gove yesterday, who stated that PGIs are very important. And Michael Gove actually did say yesterday he didn't see that there was any chance that that would be changed. Um, I, I, I will on that point to a committee member. Now my rumbles. The, I've now got the official report of the committee just come through on my phone. So I've read it out, what Michael Gove actually said about a no deal. He said, oh, the UK could get through the initial turbulence that no deal would cause. Do you agree with it? <laughs> Edward Martin. Oh. <laughs> Do you know, there's nothing like making an in intervention late, Mr. Rumbles. The intervention I thought you were making on was PGIs, which is what we were discussing at the moment, which is what's important. And as far as a no-deal Brexit, I've made my position clear that I s believe that we should have a deal and we should work hard to make it. And it's up to every single party in the UK Parliament to compromise and to find compromise and to work together. Yeah. Now, I also believe that it was a pity when we were discussing this this afternoon that so much of people's speeches were not directed directly at farmers. And because my time is short, I want to pick up on a couple of points that Mr. Ruskell made, which I think were very important. And I think we should never, ever forget that farmers are doing an excellent job in the environment. And we need to recognise what they're doing and we need to encourage them to do more. And I agree with him, this government needs to get on with the day job. Now, presiding officer, because time is short, having a vision, I believe, is easy. Implementing that vision is where it gets hard, and it's proving too hard for this government, and I don't believe it's good enough for the, for the farmers. We need a good food nation bill, and we need a government that will work forward to work out what's going to happen to farming, not next year or the year after, but in 10 years' time. And we need to work together to help that industry, an industry I believe I know well, an industry that thrives with innovation and hard work. Let's see the Cabinet Secretary and his government 
rise to the standards that they set on innovation and hard work. Currently, at the moment, they don't. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. And I close in Colin Fergus Ewing to close for the Government Cabinet Secretary till decision time, please. Well, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. There have been some, some very good contributions to this debate, and, and I think some, some other ones. Um, um, I think there is a majority consensus that the prospect of a no deal will be devastating for the food and farming industry and the wider food and drink. So I think there is a consensus about that. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that Mr. Rumble set out the arguments very clearly and cogently. And the figure that he quoted of the impact of Brexit of 2,000 million pounds loss is, as I understand it, not a Liberal Democrat SNP figure. It's based on UK government's own modelling. And actually, in discussions with... Cabinet Michael Secretary, Gover sorry, I know that you're being polite, but could you speak to the microphone, please? Yes, of Thank course, you very much. In discussions with... Uh, Michael Gove, who is nothing but unfailingly courteous and polite to everybody, um, he actually has recognised, and he's recognised in speeches in his Oxford conference, in discussions with me, and no doubt with many others, and perhaps the committee yesterday haven't had a chance to read it, that a no-deal no Brexit would be devastating for farming uh, and the rural economy. And that does make it, to my mind, very frustrating that this devastatingly bad option for Britain is not removed from the table when there is the power to do so. And I think it is relevant to point out that the reason I think it's not removed from the table is a kind of lever to force us, if you like, to, to uh, uh, go into what uh, might, we might consider to be the Brexit fire pan, the frying pan, uh, instead of the Brexit fire of a no-deal option. I think there's something pretty seedy about using a, a, that as a device, a device of allowing an option which you admit to be extremely damaging to remain on the table as a compulsor to try to persuade people to accept something which, uh, as we would see it, is, is damaging, but not perhaps so immediately so. I do think that that's an unusual, if perhaps unique, feature in British politics. I cannot think of a parallel to that. There have been excellent contributions, and I do apologize, as always, to those members who have asked me to deal with things, and I am not, not have time to do it. I don't agree with respect to Rachel Hamilton's view about new entrants, but I don't have the time to go over the stats. It would just use up all the time. I will write to Rachel Hamilton setting out the facts which show that Scotland, we've helped hundreds of, of young people as new entrants. I will set out the statistics and also point out that We've had a better... Well, I'm, I'm very sorry. I just don't have time to do justice to everybody. I, I think Colin Ross made a, a kind of speech that we were more used to hearing of examples from his region of positive contributions to the rural economy. I was pleased that he did so. Many other members did so of their constituents. Uh, and uh, I also think Mr. Rusko made a very telling argument in his closing speech about the importance of freedom of movement. I entirely agree with Mr. Ruskell. I don't actually think I've uttered that phrase before, uh, but, you know, we're, there's always a first time. But to be serious, he did set out very clearly, I think, the conundrum uh, about the plain desirability from economic, social, and a human level of maintaining the welcome that Scotland has given to people from other countries in the EU uh, and the apparent uh, message that's being sent by uh, by um, the Brexiteers. Um, many members mentioned the importance of PGIs, and I think Gail Ross in particular did so, as well as Bruce Crawford and Rhoda Grant covered all of these, as did Dr. Allen, and specific examples were given. And I think it's easy to forget that PGIs for Scotland are massively more important, massively more important than they are to any other part of the UK. And Gail Ross made a, a point I haven't heard recently made, but it's absolutely right that initially the UK government seemed to be inclined to support a broad continuance of PGIs, but of late that message seems to have changed somewhat. I, I hope perhaps we can come back to debate that in more detail. Um, much was made of a perceived failings of the Scottish government by 
the Conservatives. And I just don't accept that the picture is as black, as bleak, as depressing as they paint. And I actually think it does them an injustice to ignore some of the very positive things that I think are being appreciated by rural Scotland and by the food and drink sector. Uh, supporting of trade shows in Dubai, Boston, the world's largest trade show, the Seafood Exp Expo in Brussels, two regional showcasing events, an event in Glen Eagles will be attending later this year, a further round of funding for regional uh, food funding. In Scottish agriculture, uh, we've made the a loan payments of 241 million on the 5th of October last year, the earliest date we have made it, and also in the UK, uh, months ahead, two months ahead, in many cases of receipt of payments by farmers elsewhere in the UK. I think that's a positive thing. And the impression I get, and actually, I mean, I can't divulge confidences, but one or two conservatives, uh, not looking at anybody in particular, presiding officer, have indicated privately, actually, that this is appreciated by farmers. So why can't they just tell the truth and say it's not all bad? You know, when I was a lawyer for 20 years before I came in this place, if I'd used some of the arguments that were so flawed, so fallacious, so unfounded on fact, you'd be shot down by the sheriff in a nanosecond. It's only this partisan political argument that seems to allow a complete ignorance and ignoring and perversion of facts. I would recommend. Just pause, free just advice. pause a minute. I know you're in full flow, and grand though it is, the level of little chitty chatty that's going on is rising and rising and rising. And I'm finding this very interesting, Cabinet Secretary, as we all are. So let's hear you. Uh, well, I strongly disapprove of chitty chatty. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I do commend, and uh, you know, this is free advice from a, still as a, a solicitor, non practicing to Tories. Stop being so negative. You're not getting anywhere. You're, 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 in a, you're in an alpine crevasse of your own creation. <laughs> What's happening is you're in the crevasse. There's no rescue team. You're freezing to death. Your political prospects are frozen over. The Scottish Tories have discovered political permafrost. <laughs> Signing officer, we're here to celebrate Scottish food and drink, and uh, I had uh, for lunch for, for, Scot for lunch today I had a tin of Baxter's cream of chicken soup with some Graham's butter and a Scottish morning roll. I haven't yet had the opportunity for my second course, the Tunnock's caramel wafer, and it says here. More than six million of these biscuits made and sold every week. Prime Scottish produce, presiding officer. I am proud of them all. We're here to celebrate them all. For goodness sake, let's be positive about Scotland, even the Tories. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the impact of Brexit on Scotland's food and drink. We're going to turn straight to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 17304.1 in the name of Donald Cameron, which seeks to amend Motion 17304 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the impact of Brexit on Scotland's food and drink, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17304.1 in the name of Donald Cameron is yes, 29, no, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17304.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
on amendment number 17304.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 14, no, 97. There were no abstentions. The amendment is not agreed. The next question is the amendment 17304.3 in the name of Mark Ruskell, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17304.3 in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 20, no, 35. There were 56 abstentions. The motion, the amendment, sorry, is therefore not agreed. And the final question, is that motion 17304 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the impact of Brexit on Scotland's food and drink be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may vote now. The result of the vote on motion 17304 in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 76, no, 29. There were six abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.